Fifth Eighth's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. So glad to have you with me. We'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. It's fast paced, carefully crafted to cover all of San Diego, the good and the bad. We'll share the top stories with you as well as something you can learn from and hopefully give you a reason to smile. We do start though with our weather from flooding to uprooted trees. We're taking a closer look at all of the damage that was caused by these recent storms. Some of you may be wondering who's responsible if your home floods or if a tree falls onto your property. Well, we, of course, are always working for you to get answers. CBS 8's Shannon Handy reached out to some experts and breaks down what you need to know. This is something people up and down the state are dealing with, including here in San Diego. Take this tree here in Pacific Beach, for example. It toppled over damaging cars, and not far from here, homes along the boardwalk were flooded. It turns out you could be covered, but only if you have the right insurance. From mudslides to flooding and fallen trees, people living all over California have been impacted by a series of damaging storms. Jeez, that's wild. Last week, a tree in Scripps Ranch split Cameron Panlasigi's car in half. In Southcrest, a palm tree toppled over onto a home, displacing a family inside. Wow, their house just got flooded over there. And along the Mission Beach Boardwalk, a high tide combined with massive waves sent water rushing into several units. We've had some small things, but we've had some massive where people sitting pictures two, three feet of water in the first floor of their house. Aaron Farmer is a San Diego based agent with Jump Insurance Services. I reached out to him to get answers to some questions a lot of us have right now. For starters, what do you do if your home floods? Farmer says unless you have flood insurance, you're likely on the hook. If you're in a high risk flood zone, then the mortgage company will require that you get a flood policy. But when you're not in a high risk zone, then it's optional. And so a lot of people today are finding out that they are not having coverage. What about trees? Who is responsible if one falls and damages your home or car? For homes, farmer told me if it's on your property and you kept it well maintained, your homeowner's policy should cover the cost. When it comes to wind, uh, trees, hazard policy generally would take care of that. If your car was damaged, you should also be covered if you have comprehensive insurance. Keep in mind, the state of California only requires drivers have liability coverage. Another thing to consider, what if a tree involved is the responsibility of your neighbor or the city? If it's a neighbor, your insurance company can go after their insurance company. As for the city, a San Diego spokesperson sent me this statement saying in part, someone can file a claim with the city and staff from the city's risk management department will investigate as they do with all claims filed with the city. Each claim is evaluated on its own merit based on individual facts and circumstances. Now, if you're a renter, your landlord should take care of the property damage. But unless you have renter's insurance, any personal belongings that were damaged are likely not covered. Working for you, I'm Shanna Handy. And don't forget, here at CBS 8, we are working for you. If there's something you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at CBS 8. Com. It really was an impressive amount of rain. The city of San Diego is now dispatching more crews to deal with the increase in potholes. We caught up with one of them fixing the trouble spots along Balboa Avenue in Claremont. Normally, up to nine two-person teams are available for repairs. But now the city says about 150 employees will be assigned. City officials say the storm has increased the daily average pothole reports from 200 to a backlog of now more than 1600. If you need to report potholes, you can do it on the city of San Diego's Get It Done app. And if your car is damaged, you can file a claim. Of course, we do have that information on CBS8.com as well. Surfers, though, also chiming in on the storm, telling us that the recent swells are some of the largest they have seen in two decades. Those swells wiped away sand from the rocks at Wind and Sea, making it tough for surfers, though, to get in and out of the water. A few San Diego landmarks are closed indefinitely due to the storm damage, including the Ocean Beach Pier, the Children's Pool Seawall in La Jolla, and the Stone Steps at Moonlight Beach in Encinitas. This week, we saw again downed trees, including one in El Cajone and another in Carmel Valley. Dozens have come down around the county over the past few days. The forester for the city of San Diego told us that since Saturday, he has received more than 90 requests from the public related to fallen trees. If you are concerned about a tree on your private property, you can call a certified arborist to conduct a tree risk assessment. 
If it is on City of San Diego property, though, again, call the city. The structure of the tree, um, what are the branch angle attachments, and we like to see wider angles of attachments rather than uh, V attachments. You can also protect trees by pruning branches so that they don't catch as much wind and making sure that the roots are strong and healthy. Yeah, and as the winter storms kept rolling through, San Diegans living on the streets were put in a tough situation. Here's a look at East Village. Tents lining the streets, pieces of wet blankets and clothing scattered on the sidewalks. Homeless advocates say that most shelters are full, so people are left with few options. They say more congregate shelters and hotel vouchers are needed to keep people out of the rain. We need more congregate shelters. We need beds. People want a place to go. I seldom come across someone that says I don't want shelter. Yeah, the city does have four inclement weather shelters, but those only provide shelter during the evening hours and then guests do have to leave in the morning. Now, some of you at home are wondering if all of this rain and snow is going to help relieve California's drought. We certainly hope so. Experts do say yes, but it'll take more than a few weeks of rain to solve our water problem. Right now, the Sierra Nevada snowpack is at 200% of its average. That's one of its best starts in the past four decades. Reservoirs are also filling up, but California isn't capable of collecting all of the rainwater. Our water collection system is designed to prevent flooding, so most of the water just goes right back into the ocean. We are getting exactly what we need to bust the drought, but we still have two thirds of the wet season to come, and we could get very little precipitation. You know, it's very unpredictable. Yeah, in San Diego, more than 80% of our water is imported, then dispersed into reservoirs around the county. Experts say for us, come springtime, the snowpack and the Colorado, Colorado Basin do matter the most. Well, now to the ongoing case of a missing Chula Vista mom. Larry Miliette was carrying a handgun in his waistband when he made a death threat a few months before his wife, Maya Miliette, went missing. That's all according to testimony by Maya's father in court this week. He testified he wasn't exactly sure who was being threatened. As CBS 8's David Godfredson reports, court records show that Larry Miliette thought his wife was having an affair. Hello, hello. The father of Maya Miliete, Pablito Tabalanza, used a translator to testify during day four of the preliminary hearing of Larry Miliete, who is charged with Maya's murder. The 72-year-old recounted the day he showed up at the family's house in Chula Vista less than 48 hours after Maya went missing. Larry answered the door and told him Maya was locked inside her bedroom. What I did, I ran upstairs and then I knocked on the door. Walang sumagot. No one answered. Binondol ko nang binondol yung kwan. Wala. I just kept uh, bumping the door. I kept uh, doing it repeatedly. He banged on the door for five minutes and finally... Sabi niya, meron. When no one, no one was answering, I asked Larry if he has a key. He said, uh, yes, I have. He took uh, the key out of his pocket and then he opened the door. Maya was not inside. Later, Larry put his arm around his father-in-law, according to testimony, and said this. He told me, like, don't worry, Papa, she will be back, and I, I cannot do that to her because I love her. The father also testified about an incident three or four months earlier where Larry made a death threat, saying he was going to, quote, kill him, though the target of that threat was not named. After saying that, he raised his shirt and then he showed me his gun. The father testified he clearly saw a 9 millimeter handgun under Larry's shirt. Later, Maya's sister-in-law, Genesis Tavalanza, took the stand, testifying Larry was worried Maya was having an affair. He was suspecting there's, there's an affair. Throughout 2020, the defendant grew increasingly paranoid that May was having an affair, and he began to monitor her whereabouts, according to court filings in the case. On June 27, 2020, the defendant told Genesis he caught May in a truck in the Southwest Regional Maintenance Center parking lot. 
Chula Vista police officer Ryan Culver testified he spoke to a friend of Maya's who reported domestic violence in the marriage. She specifically recounted one incident that May was so in fear for her safety that she locked herself in a bathroom, but Mr. Millette punched through the drywall that was next to the bathroom door to unlock it from the inside so that he could approach right. May. David Godfordson, CBS 8. Yeah, and that last comment made by the police officer was actually stricken from the record by the judge who ruled it was hearsay. The preliminary hearing will continue this week. Meantime, the gunman in a deadly shooting spree in the gas lamp quarter will likely be spending the rest of his life behind bars. 34 year old Travis Serata, he was sentenced to four life terms on Thursday. Prosecutors say he wandered around downtown in April of 2021 and started shooting random victims with a ghost gun. He killed 28 year old Justice Bolden and injured four others. Bolden's family was there in the courtroom for sentencing. The man who decided that his life wasn't worth it will never understand what it's like to love the way that we love justice. If you did, you wouldn't do this. Yeah, Sarasta was sentenced to a state prison. And a former skateboarding superstar from North County behind bars for a brutal murder he confessed to will remain in prison even after the state decided to grant him parole. Mark Rogowski, known better in the skateboarding world as Gator, has served more than three decades in prison for raping and killing Jessica Bergston in 1991. Granted parole last year for a second time, Governor Newsom once again, though, overturned the state parole board's decision to release him. Rogowski's attorney says that he has earned his parole. His crime is, is tragic and horrific, but he has done everything a person could possibly do to make amends, to rehabilitate himself, to try to help others inside the prison to see the error of their ways as well. San Diego County District Attorney Summer Steffen has opposed Rogowski's release on parole. He will be eligible to be considered for parole again this coming November in about just 10 months time. And 30 guns were confiscated at San Diego International last year, tying a record high set in 2021. TSA agents found a record number of guns at security checkpoints, in fact, across the country last year. CBS 8's Kirsten Holmes spent the day taking a closer look at the concerning data. That's going to slow you down and everybody behind you. Lori Dankers with California TSA says gun seizures at checkpoints reached a record high of 6,542 last year. What's scary is 88% of those guns were loaded. And the number of confiscated guns has been increasing every year since 2010, except for 2020 because travel was down due to the pandemic. Do you know you're not supposed to bring a gun through TSA? No, I didn't know that. Take a look at the numbers. The top 10 airports finding the most guns at security checkpoint include Denver, Phoenix, Dallas, and Hartsfield Jackson International in Atlanta. They had a whopping 448 gun seized in 2022 alone. Travelers we talked to at San Diego International say they aren't surprised to see San Diego not pulling those numbers. San Diego's always have been has always made me feel safe and in, in everything that we do. So we're definitely in the right place and the right airport. I mean, every time we go through the terminals, they definitely make you, you know, take everything off and they do a full search. So you would think that they would find those guns. There's absolutely no reason to bring your firearm and carry on luggage uh, to the checkpoint because there is a process by which you can travel with your firearm on a commercial aircraft. Put all of this in a hard sided case, lock it up and make sure that you use non TSA approved locks. We only want the owner of the firearm to have access to the contents of the case. While San Diego is not near the top of the list, we're trending in the wrong direction with 22 guns found in 2018 and now 30 guns found in 2021 and 2022. We're looking for the responsible gun owners to go ahead and be responsible, and that is make sure that you're not bringing your gun and your carry-on luggage, the bottom of your bag. That was our Kirsten Holmes reporting. Now, if you do get caught with a gun going through TSA, know that you will have to stop and submit to a search. Airport police will have to be called and you're looking at a fine of up to $15,000. TSA officials are hoping that educating the public about the right way to travel with a gun will help.
Meantime, San Diego County is hoping to reduce gun violence and is asking for your help. Gun violence includes suicide, domestic violence, accidental shootings, and violence related to gangs. The county just opened a new survey asking people how it impacts them in their neighborhood. The county hopes the responses that they get will help them better understand these situations and also find solutions. There, there are so many elements that, that seem to fit into the overall umbrella under the umbrella of gun violence. Um, so it's important that the county is, is looking at this and um, until you know the problem, it's hard to look for the solutions. Yeah, the survey is anonymous and open to anyone who lives or works in San Diego County. The survey closes in four weeks. You can find that link to it on CBS8.com. Well, with the new year comes some new state laws. So now we're taking a closer look at Senate Bill 960, which changed the qualifications for being a police officer here in California. The law took effect at the start of the year, and now anyone who is legally authorized to work in the U.S. under federal law can be a police officer, regardless of their citizenship. Our Marcella Lee will now clear up some misconceptions about the new law by going directly to the state senator who authored the bill and we talk with the San Diego Police Officers Association about their concerns. Right now, the San Diego Police Department has lost over 500 officers since July of 2020. That's drastic. We need everyone we can to be able to be a police officer. However, we are not in favor of reducing the requirements and lowering the standards. Sergeant Jared Wilson speaking as president and on behalf of the San Diego Police Officers Association says they do have concerns about the new California law that changed the qualifications to become a police officer in the state. Prior to January 1st of this year, you had to be a United States citizen or permanent resident to qualify for the job. Now, that's no longer the case. Anyone who is legally authorized to work in the state of California with the proper green card or visa is now eligible to become a police officer, thanks to Senate Bill 960, authored by State Senator Nancy Skinner. When you look at California's rules, almost every other profession, lawyers, doctors, are able to be part of that profession as long as they have full federal legal work authorization. It was only our sworn officers that we restricted that way, even firefighters. And ironically, in the military, you could be an officer in the military and you could not be a peace officer in California. So that's why we felt it was totally right to fix the rule. Just to make things perfectly clear, we're not talking about undocumented workers. No, you have to have full legal work authorization. I think that's the misconception that a lot of people have. Certainly. Senator Skinner says it was the University of California Police Department that first reached out and pushed for the change. During a time when police departments across the state are struggling to fill positions, UC Davis Thank Police you. Chief the Joe Farrow testified at an Assembly Public serve. Safety Committee hearing. They see a lot of stellar candidates in their programs who they ultimately can't hire. We wanted to come to the legislature to see if we can't change that law, and that's why I'm here today. The bill passed, changing things for people like uh, UC Davis graduate and DACA recipient very Ernesto very Marone, who attended the UC Police Academy and passed the background check, but wasn't eligible to be hired as an officer until now. This bill will allow me and countless others the opportunity to fulfill my dream of serving the communities where I was raised, educated, and live as a sworn police officer. The SDPOA says while they don't support the new law, they do acknowledge it will help people like Marone. The public demands and deserves a high quality police force and officers that uh, meet stringent standards. So we're not in favor of lowering these standards at all. However, I think there's a handful of people who have been in this country a long time will be able to hire as a result of this uh, and hopefully they become citizens. Do you feel you are lowering the standards of what it takes to be a peace officer? Not at all, not at all. They would still have to meet every other qualification. Let's say I'm a green card holder. I have to get the background check. I have to meet every other requirement. Marcella, thanks. And Senator Skinner says that there's a current backlog of six to 10 years for people to become a U.S. citizen. So this allows qualified candidates to get to work serving our communities. Right now, DACA recipients are allowed to continue renewing their status and obtain legal authorization to work, but new applications are not being accepted. Both San Diego Police and the Sheriff's Department are updating their policies to reflect the new requirement. 
Well, after spending 35 years in prison, a South Bay man is turning sobriety into success for himself and others. As we take you in the Zevely Zone, Jeff visits the McAllister Institute in Chula Vista. If you've ever wondered what kind of difference one person could make, it's all standing right here. I love these guys. I love these guys. Joey Rubio is turning a lifetime of mistakes into miracles. By the time I was seven, eight, I took to the streets, you know. Joey grew up in the projects of Brooklyn and started selling and using heroin at the age of 10. Gang banging, drugs, guns. After spending 35 years of his life behind bars. This is me in prison. Joey finally freed himself of shackles and addictions. How long have you been sober? Seven years. I haven't looked back. Thank you. Yeah. Five years ago, when the McAllister Institute took a chance on Joey, he had no job skills. He couldn't even turn on a computer. But that didn't stop him from teaming up with police and park rangers to launch a program called Work for Hope. Maria came to my program. I mean, I got so many people here that have come to my program. One step outside his office, and Joey is surrounded by success stories. I really appreciate him. <laughs> I really appreciate him. Instead of living on the streets and addicted to drugs, <laughs> Maria is now sober with a job. He helped me. Um, I made something out of nothing. Joey and his clients have beautified more than 90 parks with a program that needs funding. You go to City Hall and everybody raises their hand, we want to help you, we want to help you, but when it comes time to help you, nobody's there. Joey's passion brings his boss. I don't know anybody who has as much heart as he does. He, uh, Carlos Cuervo to tears. I just don't know anybody with that much heart. When I first came in here for help, I was, uh, I was homeless for about a year. I was smoking meth. Joey also helped Royce land a job and get half custody of his daughter back. Joey and uh, the staff here at McAllister Institute are the reason why my life is going the way it's going right now. A guy who used to run from the police now teams up with them to throw people a lifeline. I got my family back because of this program. Archimedes also got a job and his child back and wanted to say this about second chances. That they're possible that there's a lot of people just like me that need help, just need a push. This is the love and support Joey never had. I wanted to change, like I needed to change, and it helped me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I, I appreciate it. I really do. <laughs> 35 years of hard time. And Joey still has the softest of hearts. <laughs> he chokes me up. Chokes me up. In the Zevely Zone, Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. Another good one, Jeff, thank you. And Joey did go back to school to become a drug and alcohol counselor. If you know someone who needs his help finding a job and getting sober, click on the help button on CBS8.com. Well, we have learned that construction on a new border fence through Friendship Park will continue. Customs and Border Protection says that they are going to resume replacing the border fence with two new 30-foot barriers. The project was paused last August to get public feedback following community backlash. In a statement, the group of Friendship at the Friends of Friendship Park rejected and condemned the move, saying that, that it will desecrate the park's binational character. Construction is now expected to take about six months to finish. And did you see this one? Three people on board a small plane that made an emergency water landing off of Carlsbad Beach all walked away unharmed. The FAA says that the plane was en route from Montgomery Field to Orange County when it encountered engine trouble. The pilot ditched it in the water about 30 yards off of South Carlsbad State Beach, and then it floated to shore. Again, the pilot and two passengers all made it out okay. 
Well, now to COVID. San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria wants to extend the city's state of local emergency for COVID-19, but only by about three weeks. Right now, it is set to expire on February 9th. In a staff report obtained by CBS 8, the mayor's office is suggesting the city council to extend the local emergency until February 28th. That's the same day California's state of emergency is set to end. The council is expected to vote on a resolution at their meeting this week. And this week actually marked three years since the first COVID case was confirmed in the United States. Here locally, Scripps Research works daily to better understand the virus. They are currently focused on those who are immunocompromised and those who have long-term side effects. Over the past three years, 102 million people in the U.S. have been infected and more than a million have died. It was the leading cause of death in both 2020 and 2021. So if it's here to stay, Scripps wants to know more. So the study of COVID in people who are immunocompromised aims to detect and treat it early, all with the goal of reducing hospitalization rates. 10,000 people from across the country will be given 10 at-home test kits a month to track an early diagnosis. As for the long-haul study, the research team is finding that for about 10% of people, the virus can really linger in the body and be found in all of your tissues issues, not just the lungs, for example, impacting the gut and even your brain. A lot of people think, oh, you know, COVID's no big deal. I already had it, but it actually could get you um, on a subsequent infection. And the virus is changing all the time with the new variants that are coming out. Yeah, so because your symptoms can change after getting it a second time, there's motivation to keep up with the basics, all to avoid getting sick. And more volunteers are needed, by the way, for the study. If you qualify, you'll get a smartwatch and an Amazon gift card. We have more info on CBS8.com. Just click the help button. Well, you've probably heard it before that we only use 10% of our brains. Is that true or is it just a myth? Here's our Verify team. How much of our brains do we actually use? You've probably heard that it's only about 10%, which means we're missing out on a lot of untapped brain power. Verify viewer Lucia asked our team to find out if this theory is true or false. So Lucia, let's verify. We went to these sources for an answer and they all agree. This claim? is false. We don't use only 10%, we use 100% of our brain. Neuroscientist Dr. Eric Chudler says with the help of brain imaging techniques like functional MRIs and PET scans, scientists have proven that we use 100% of our brains every day. And when you look at a brain image, all parts of the brain are, are doing something. There's no part of the brain that's just sitting there inactive. So where did this myth come from? Chudler says one of the possible origination theories dates back to 1907. Psychologist uh, William James wrote in a very influential book that uh, we only use part of our possible mental or uh, physical resources, but he never put a percentage on it. According to the Association for Psychological Science, James did not claim that humans only use a small portion of their brains. Instead, they say James was observing how decorum, social norms, and routines fail to engage all of people's resources. So we can verify, no, humans don't only use 10% of our brains. With your Verify, I'm Ariane Daytil. Sure, interesting, right? Well, again, a new year and new you. If that means tackling a new diet, the size of dinner plates at home and in the restaurant could make it tough to meet your goal. CBS Aid's Abby Black verifies if dinner plates are larger than they were growing up. With the new year comes new resolutions, and many of us would like to lose weight and choose to eat healthier. But it can be tough if the size of our dinner plates are much larger. Some claim that the salad plates that we eat off today are the same size of what our dinner plates used to be back in the 60s. So we verify, are dishes larger than what they were six decades ago? Our sources are registered dietitian and cookbook author Lisa Andrews, nutrition dietitian Dr. Sandra Frank, who analyzed plate sizes, and the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. If your New Year's resolution is to shed some weight with exercise and diet, registered dietitian Lisa Andrews says portion control may be tough. So the plates themselves have definitely increased. So they are quite a bit bigger, about 36%. 
When you Google plate sizes over the years, the blog post written by registered nutrition dietitian Dr. Sandra Frank is populated at the top. I started to wonder, you know, how much has plate sizes changed? And that's when I went into like a dollar store with a tape measure and I started to pull different plates. Frank says she knows from personal experience, but also found that plate sizes have grown from eight and a half inches in 1960 to 10 inches in the 1980s, 11 inches in the 2000s to 12 inches today. That means salad plates we use now used to be the size of our dinner plate in the 60s. Frank says this means with dishes that size, calories on a plate have more than doubled. People like to fill their plates. And once they fill their plate and they eat everything on the plate, there's a feeling of satisfaction. To-go cups are sizing up too. Food historian Dr. Ashley Young at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History says anecdotally, she observed the increase in plate size in the second half of the 20th century, but points to an exhibit in the museum. It shows in the 1970s, 7-Eleven Slurpees were served in 12-ounce cups, and in 2017, the Texas-based Stripes Convenience Store served the slushie in a 64-ounce container. Why do you think that the size of plates are larger now? It's a good question, but I think it's just sort of this customer, like we need to please the customer and in, in this assumption that more is probably better. So we can verify that, yes, the size of dishes is larger than what it was in the 1960s. With your Verify, I'm Abby Alford, CBS 8. Now you have something to blame, right? <laughs> Hope the New Year's off to a good start. Well, Disney's award-winning musical Frozen just arrived at the Civic Theater for a two-week engagement. As we take you back inside the Zevely Zone, Jeff gets a sneak peek at the Tony-nominated production and meets the musical's two stars. The cast from Frozen would have preferred visiting San Diego during the warmer summer months, but you know, the cold never bothered them anyway. Move over, Lion King. Disney just blew into town with 20 trucks and another massive show. Let it go, let it go. Critics say Frozen is thawing hearts from coast to coast with reviews that are anything but chilly. San Diego is never this cold, so I'm blaming <laughs> both of you. Yes, Elsa has brought the cold. Caroline Bowman has traveled the world playing the lead in Evita and says Elsa is another strong-willed woman. You will not be disappointed coming to see this show. Five productions of Frozen are traveling the world in England, Australia, and Japan. The Tony-nominated Best Musical completed its Broadway run, breaking four house records. More than one million people have seen the North American tour of Frozen, which just arrived in San Diego for the first time. It's all the songs that they loved from the movie and then some. Yeah. And so we get a deeper look into these characters. That's a really special thing. Lauren Nicole Chapman plays Elsa's sister, Anna. It's so lovely to see two empowered young women come together and ultimately celebrate their differences and raise each other up. Off stage, Lauren and Caroline are close friends, so it always feels right when the estranged onstage sisters break the ice. In the end, you two hug it out. <laughs> you can yeah. say that. Yeah. You can say that. <laughs> we hug a lot in the show. We do. I know you guys have a sound check. Could you give us a mini sound check? No, you're gonna have to come see the show. Okay. <laughs> With two terrific leads and the magic of Disney, this cast is ready to warm the hearts of San Diego and... In the Zevely Zone, Jeff Zevely, CBS 6. You're welcome for getting it stuck in your head, right? <laughs> the creative team for Disney's Frozen has won a total of 16 Tony Awards and an Oscar. The production will run at the Civic Theater through January 29th. For ticket information, you can head to the Zevely Zone page on CBS8.com.
Well, the week did start with MLK Day. More than 700 people honored Dr. King in Balboa Park on Monday at the 35th annual All People Celebration. Many of the young people there told us that the power of Dr. King's message is timeless and resonates with them still. It's just like a really good example about how we need to be like resilient and keep trying and just keep going no matter what happens. Absolutely. Martin Luther King Jr. helped drive the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He was killed in 1968, just at the age of 39. Dr. King would be 94 years old today. Wonder what he would have done. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care of yourself.